Hola, bienvenidos a todos y todas a el conversatorio Dimensions of Embodiment, que pues va, vamos a tener durante una hora. Eh, muchas gracias al Festival Sur Atómica por este espacio, por esta oportunidad. Tenemos tres invitados de talla mundial, por no decir menos. Eh, va a estar increíble, tres personas con labores y prácticas verdaderamente impresionantes. Entonces, bueno, esta charla va a ser en inglés, es un conversatorio. Entonces, bueno, gracias a todos los que no ven, nos ven y bueno, me paso a inglés. Hello everyone. Um, thank you very much for being uh, here digitally in the uh, Suratomica Festival. Uh, this uh, is the second event of today. We had a fascinating talk with uh, one of our guests today, Paul Vanus, who's uh, shared uh, quite a bit of his work and now is going to participate in this talk. And um, well, now we're going to proceed with this, uh, this conversation, uh, which is called uh, Dimensions of Embodiment. Uh, well, I want to begin by introducing our guests. Uh, well, first we have Paul Vanus, who I already mentioned, who well, did a, a, an amazing presentation about uh, well, what he does. Just a few minutes ago, uh, Paul is um, uh, the director of the Coales Center of Biological Art and uh, uh, the co-director of Emergent Practices at the University of Buffalo, as well as well an amazing bio artist, as those who saw his presentation would know. Uh, thank you, Paul, for being here. Thank you for joining us uh, in this conversation, as well as for sharing your work in that really fascinating talk we just had the fortune of seeing. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you, thank you. Um, well, second, we have uh, Michael Hock, who is uh, the director of art at CMS at CERN. He is a, a very close friend of Suratomica. He has uh, helped us facilitate, well, our, our relationship with CERN at, with, through art at CMS, which is, uh, uh, well, Michael will tell us more about it in a moment, I'm sure. <laughs> Uh, he's also, well, he works at CERN as a physicist, and he's also uh, an, an amazing artist, which is also, I hope, what he'll be telling us a bit about in, in a few minutes. And, uh, well, we have uh, Rosa Menkman, who is uh, an amazing media artist, uh, a glitch artist, uh, a theorist of resolution as uh, a conceptual framework, and a lot more, I'm sure Rosa will tell us exactly what she does soon. And um, she is, uh, as far as I understand, uh, works at as a guest artist in CERN. And uh, well, we'll let us know more about that uh, uh, soon. Um, we will begin the talk with, well, our guests uh, telling us a bit about their work. And then we'll proceed to well, talk about dimensions of embodiment, which is the, the theme for this conversation. So. Well, we can start with Mikhail. You can go ahead and, uh, well, yeah, tell us about you and your work, please. Um, yes, hello. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks for having me here. Um, I'm, I feel honored to be a, a, a part of uh, Sur Atomica. And uh, I will explain a little bit to introduce myself and to, to introduce our collaboration. Uh, which I find very, very much important, and not just for the people who are involved, but also for our society. A um, uh, few words about me. I, I come, I'm from Austria. I studied in Austria, in Vienna, and uh, in technical school, and then I, 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 um, I studied in the University of Technology in, in Vienna and in the University of, uh, of Vienna to be also a, a teacher for sports and physics, but in the University of Technology, I, I, I studied applied physics. And during my studies, I, I, I also joined the Art Academy because we, uh, with, the, with our institute in the applied uh, arts, uh, applied um, uh, physics, and, uh, I, we had a, a, a working relation because we created um, uh, some equipment with them. So I sneaked in also in, into the arts uh, of the art university, and I I I, I, ca I come from the pro uh, from the uh, from the arts from the photography. So I made a lot of photographs 
during my PhD at CERN, uh, there was no time for any arts. But after, uh, when I was hired and I constructed these big instruments at CERN for the ALICE experiment, I, uh, when it appeared, uh, then I, st I, I was so intrigued by the geometry and by the pu a huge dimension um, that I started more again uh, taking photos, documentary photos, then launching up uh, to ab abstract photos, and then I created out of my material, photo, photo material uh, uh, artworks. I will uh, let you uh, tell you a little bit later, um, and then I joined CMS. And while I join CMS, I will quickly uh, join, uh, share a screen to a presentation. Uh, so this one, uh, where I want to make it uh, somehow. Uh, where is it? Um, I think it's in maybe. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, can you see, you see now the full screen? Okay, yes. so um, out, out of this experience uh, with my art, own art, uh, when I presented it, um, I, um, I, cre I, I, I could experience a lot of um, um, uh, intriguement of others, of the audience, how uh, on the scientific topics. So I thought I'm not enough. I need to collaborate with other artists and other scientists and 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 explore this even more. So we created Art at CMS, um, where I we linked uh, artists wherever they are in, in, in on the globe with scientists wherever our people are, and then in 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 um, invited them to CERN uh, and to also experience uh, the uh, the the real uh, experiment, but uh, the real dialogue is not just going on at CERN. It's always going on where the people are. So it's and that's why uh, here in uh, Suatomica, this is exactly uh, how it should be. The, uh, you create a dialogue and you link it and network it uh, to our scientific global scientific community. And of course, uh, as Suatomica does as well, you. Uh, uh, connect and network also to a global um, uh, artistic network. So like, like this, we, we, we become more and more strong. And, and uh, then 2017, uh, we enlarged Art at CMS, uh, the methodology, we used a, a methodology and uh, connected also to other uh, uh, huge global operating uh, collaborations, science collaborations, uh, like uh, the LHC uh, ex uh, exper uh, experiments, Atlas, ELIS, uh, LHCB, and uh, uh, Virgo and LIGO for from um, gravitational waves and Ice Cube. Um, so and uh, so to con connect all the scientific community who are always all working on a similar topic, namely trying to explain and trying to understand and reveal the secrets of nature. So what we do, we uh, inter in, uh, interdisciplinary connect, engage people and network people. I mean, uh, also will talk, uh, so we are not uh, art at CMS or origin is not an artist in residence program. It's a it's an engagement and networking program. It's it's collaborating with artists and art communities like we do here with Sua Atomica. We are uh, Rosa, uh, Rosa will talk about uh, art at CERN uh, later, but this is a pure uh, artist in residence program. So there's com something completely different. We're doing something complementary. Another important thing on uh, my mission, because if you if you uh, s s see a little bit what's going on politically on the world, um, we we you will understand that uh, we have to we have to um, somehow. Uh, inject critical thinking and creative challenge the uh, solve challenges in a creative way to the next generation so one important aspect is also to to get uh, met, uh, scientific methodology and artistic uh, reflections on on, on topics uh, to the next generation so this is uh, with different uh, formats we created Sayad masterclass so and uh, and we run this uh, educational uh, part also uh, globally. So in here you see in the National History Museum in Vienna at CERN. Uh, this is in uh, Cultural Coalition event where they uh, there 
we invited in the Science Center uh, several international artists. We had three local artists and we uh, set it up a huge uh, scientific um, uh, exhibition with the arts reflecting the topics and running lectures, art lectures, science lectures, art workshops and science lectures for uh, school students in, the, in this respect. So, and uh, this, this is uh, an, an event in, um, uh, in South Korea last year. Uh, and this is a, a, an event in, uh, in Switzerland just, and this is a, a last event uh, in Vienna. So, and there we, and this is another thing. Uh, so this one thing is for the school students where we try then uh, make them learn, risk do the research on the scientific topics, but also and then with the art practice where artists, our collaborative artists are present. And here you see uh, uh, also Daniel, Daniela in, in Vienna. She was present and we presented the, the artworks of a course with the art universities. So uh, for me, it's important uh, to, to, uh, that, you are, that you understand somehow that we are, um, uh, the dialogue is not limited to one uh, bubble. The dialogue uh, I want to create and I is, and uh, the importance is that we spread it out to as many uh, society, uh, bubbles in the society as possible, because then we can create an impact. If we keep, if we keep uh, having it in a very small, um, um, if we keep talking to a very small um, uh, variety of people, then the impact and the reach is, is will uh, stay, stay very small. And I think what we're doing here, what I, um, what Suratomica is doing in in Colombia, and if we can spread it out in uh, in uh, to South America, and we network, then we are uh, we can really uh, make a change. And we have to include uh, for sure the next generation because these are the people we are we are feeding, and uh, they, they they should they should take over once uh, we get old and famous or we die. <laughs> So uh, let me let me quickly come uh, 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 last to my to my personal artworks because you asked me as well uh, to my personal artwork. So let me quickly share the screen once more. Um, I think this should be. Uh, do you see Do you see CMS? Okay, this is the CMS. This is actually a picture I made with a, uh, a friend of mine. This is. Well, uh, this is CMS, and this is 20 meters by 20 meters, a huge picture. But it's it's for me also an an object of uh, if if you if you if you see this, you you will understand how that it's very intri intriguing um, and and uh, from the aesthetic point of view. So I use this picture, and there I'm talking about matter and antimatter. So I merge with my pictures, and I cut here the symmetry of uh, the circular symmetry and in a different uh, uh, multiplicity and then change uh, inverted colors as a symbol of matter antimatter. So I, I speak about with my uh, collages with scientific topics, uh, with the, the, the uh, photographs, which are somehow representing <coughs> the, the science and the science architecture. This, this are the next are the series of the uh, God particle hunting machine. It's, it's again a CMS picture where I, I cut and interleave with flowers, the flowers as a symbol. Really, we're, we're, we're still in the first image. Ah, sorry, really, which, which one do you see? Uh, it's just CMS, but without any alterations, I think. Ah, um, okay, sorry. Uh, there you go. Now, now I can see the one, yeah. Do you, do you see this with the, with, with the flowers? Yes. Okay. yes, yes. Um, have you seen the, uh, th these pictures? No. Okay. <laughs> maybe you can go back quickly. It's okay, well, way. maybe let me go quickly back for just to, to see one of these. Do you see this yeah. one now? Okay, sorry. Yes. Then uh, I, I, th I think this one. I, uh, okay. <clears throat> Here, as I said, I, I cut this circular symmetry and then uh, I invert parts of it. As is, and, uh, and as, is, as, as a symbol of antimatter, because at the beginning of the universe, uh, matter and anti if you create out of energy matter, you create matter and antimatter in the same proportions, but we know everybody of us is made out of, of matter and not antimatter. So where is all the antimatter gone? This is, a, and, and CMS has one scientific um, uh, 
uh, goal also uh, in, in uh, to, uh, to to talk uh, to uh, uh, unveil uh, antimatter, and 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 it turned as an a special experiment LSCB, who is who is very is a focus on uh, met, uh, on antimatter, and he and these these are uh, now you see now the flowers, um, and these are so these are called the God party hunting machine. Uh, so I, I use the circular symmetry, cut it off, um, and interleave it with with flowers. Uh, flower is as a symbol of nature, where the the detector itself is becomes the eye of the scientist, the eye of the human, trying to uh, have have the nature in focus. So and of course, with uh, if there are three different flowers, but for me uh, and the spray of the particles creating this the signals in the detector and uh, this this is and this here is maybe the most um uh, strong uh, the strongest uh, link uh, you, you know, because this these are poppies and if you know that the the british they wear poppies always once in a year to to celebrate the first world war end of the first world war when the boys um in the in the netherlands in the netherlands Stopped killing it themselves. The, uh, the poppies were flourishing, so it's a symbol of new generation freedom collaboration. And that's exactly what these big experiments do. Atlas and CMS are the two biggest. They have uh, both more than 3,000 people working right now. I counted once uh, CMS over 20 years, uh, there were more than 11,000 people working. So, and we work. The, uh, the, uh, and the, the people come from 50 different countries, 200, uh, more than 200 different uh, university institutes. So it's a huge human endeavor. We should never forget this as well. So uh, on, on the science. There are different other uh, symmetry breaking with uh, nature interleaved. So I'm, and then uh, uh, the last series I would like to uh, uh, sh show you a reason, a re, um, these are where I play with the pop art uh, because uh, this image from CMS became an, 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 uh, an icon for the, our topic, for our scientific topics. So I use, like Andy Warhol used Marilyn Monroe um, uh, as, as, a, as, a, as a picture and then in the, and changed, played with the colors. And um, so I'm using, uh, I'm making a link to the pop art culture and these are with silk screen prints. Lovely. Um, thank you, Michael. I'm sorry I'm going to have to interrupt you because we are a bit short on time, but thank you very much. That was fascinating. Um, and hey, I'll give a, yeah, go ahead, Rosa, if you want, you can tell us about your... Hi. Hello. Uh, First of all, I want to also thank Sura Atomica for having me and uh, Daniela and Natalia and also you, Simon. And I also wanted to just quickly reach out to Johnny who was supposed to be here, but he got sick with COVID. One of the many people that are suffering right now. So just wanted to wish him good luck and be strong soon. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Oops, uh, technology is falling. Uh, maybe if you could yeah. close your microphone, Michael, please, because it might have like an echo or something. I'm also in an empty room. It's very, so there's like a whole like, rah, 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 you know, sorry for that. Um, there, can you see my screen full, full screen? Cool. So um, last year I received the CERN Collide um, residency. Uh, it's a collaboration of three years with Barcelona, the city in Spain. And um, that was really amazing. The CERN Collide is, as uh, Michael already said, it's uh, different from the CMS Experiment Art uh, Collaboration. Uh, it's really geared towards bringing one artist a year to CERN and let them get into conversation with different scientists, which is really special because that doesn't usually happen. We don't get the time. Artists don't usually get invited to talk to a scientist. They have to ask the scientist to talk to them. Right, so it was a really special experience. And what I wanted to present now is actually the, um, the subject or the, the concept that I came was invited with and how that concept has developed throughout the last year. It's been exactly a year since I was there for, three for two months. And some of the concepts have changed a lot. 
Um, but of course, also due to COVID, uh, part of the residency got actually cut short. So um, I had to really move fast to get home. And yeah, I will play you first my um, video, actually, with which I was accepted to the residency, which is called Shadow Knowledge. It's a late, clear night during the winter of 2016. From the porch of my little cabin in the Mojave Desert, I observe strange lights in the air. They are floating there along the mountain rims, maybe 30 kilometers up north. And it's not the first time that there in the distance and above a simulation village that some named Little Baghdad, I see the military test their new strange flying machines. At night I film the lights and record the unexplainable rumblings, the different forms of sound pollution in the otherwise quiet desert. Then during the day I drive around, exploring the space with my binoculars. I have read all of the few magazines in the cabin. They are issued by Cluey, the Center of Land Use Interpretation. The magazines feature several of the military outposts, ranging from nuclear test villages in Nevada to the USAF-51 aerial photo calibration targets. And it is then when I feel no longer like a lost visitor in the desert. The desert, the military and I are connected by our research in resolutions. This Google Maps screenshot depicts a slab of concrete displaying an original USA 51 resolution target, a two-dimensional optical artifact that was used for the development and calibration of aerial photography, following a measurement sometimes referred to as ground resolved distance. The resolution of an aerial photograph can be described as G GRD is smaller than 5 meters, meaning that objects of a half a meter or larger can be detected or interpreted from the image in question. Smaller objects presumably will not be able to be resolved and are therefore non-interpretable. During a long Google Maps stumble session, I suddenly roll over the coordinates of one of the huge slabs of concrete and surprisingly, it's located rather close to me. It's a three hours drive northwest of the cabin, east of the Mojave base Fort Irwin. It's a pilgrimage that needs to be prepared. It's not clear if the dirt roads are leading to the lonesome decommissioned slab of concrete and if they are even maintained. But the slab of obsolete technology speaks to me. It's the first physical embodiment of my research. Here's my proposal. Since about four years, I've been researching what resolutions are. And at this point, I define resolutions as a means to make things function, but also as a means to make other things not function. A resolution is not just a solution, it's also always a compromise. However, the normal user is only trained to work with the things that function and not to consider what is being compromised. In my recent research into resolutions, I've subdivided my practice into five major strands of resolution studies. Habit, material, genealogy, institution, and scale. And during my possible residency at CERN, I would like to focus more on the issues of scale or scale and dimensions. So what does it mean to scale things? What happens when something exists outside the dimensions or system units of scale? And I'm sure that at CERN, the scientists are aware, like nowhere else, that in order to distinguish something of significance from its background environment, they must first be able to perceive it. If it remains invisible, inaudible, intangible, it is indescribable and therefore unknowable, at least to most of us. But the discovery of the Higgs boson particle I will cut it here short because there's just a few more minutes left. Uh, now I need to get out of, yeah, there we are, cool. Um, and go to the next slide. 
Um, what turns out when you are actually uh, invited to a place like CERN, the research always changes. Actually, that's with any research that you do, right? When you start a research, it always changes and your research question changes. And if you learn from the scientists, which is the only thing you can do anyway, then you have to change your research question. So I changed my um, research question while I was at CERN into impossible images. And what I did is every scientist that I got the chance to talk with, I asked them the same question, which was, imagine you could obtain an impossible image of an object or a phenomenon that you think is uh, uh, important with no limits on spatial, temporal, energy, signal to noise or cost resolutions, what image would you create? And of course, the answers to these questions could be also entirely imaginable. And it was really interesting because I got such a wild collection of impossible images that just, you know, that completely expanded my idea of thinking through what it means to perceive, what types of skill and resolutions and affordances are actually existing in uh, the biggest experiment of the world. And so out of that came uh, a part of a work, a video work that is called Whiteout. Um, Whiteout is a it's a narrative, it's a story of me climbing a mountain in a snowstorm. And while I'm in the snowstorm, everything becomes white, I cannot see anything. Luckily, um, I was planning to go to the top of the mountain and see uh, an antenna there. The antenna never got visible, but I had a device with me and that would translate the transmissions of the antenna, um, the electromagnetic frequency spectrum at which is like sending messages that I could hear in my ears. So I started to think about what other ways there are to perceive. And I wanted to uh, play a little piece of the work that came out of that. I think about last month when I had the opportunity to speak to several particle physicists. I asked them about hypothetical, impossible images. Imagine you could obtain an impossible image of any object or phenomenon that you think is important, with no limits to spatial, temporal, energy, cost or signal-to-noise resolutions. You could even imagine a speculative image produced beyond resolution. An image defying the possible settings involved in image processing. What image would you create? I now have a collection of impossible images that offer me an insight into the limits of different imaging technologies. But the collection also offered me a preliminary categorization of impossible where seeing beyond the wavelengths of light or at the absolute smallest increment of time could produce incredible perspectives, capturing both all and nothing at the same time. But it also sparked thought of the impossible through time. How ways of seeing that are not just technically impossible but beyond our imagination can become commonplace. Or, on the other hand, how possible images can become inaccessible, broken or even out of range. What is possible and what is impossible then seem to me to be connected as much to time and technological resolution as to imagination, speculation or belief. One answer especially stands out to me as I walk here. A scientist told me he wished to have antennas mounted in his eye sockets to see through the walls and straight into the electromagnetic spectrum. With 2020 electromagnetic vision, his sight would entail everything, from electricity to cosmic rays, including the colors that I'm currently blind to. With antennas as eyeballs, I could clearly distinguish the antenna on top of this mountain. The beacon would actually be relentlessly screaming at me in signals stretching beyond the infrared. But I see nothing. Sorry, when I'm full screen, I cannot see my pointer anymore. So I had to 
get out of the full screen for a second um, to unmute myself. So what I found is um, what I would say is definitely a preliminary category of impossible images. The whole video is actually 15 minutes long and available online if you just research or if you just search for uh, white out. Um, this is not um, a finished categorization and I'm very excited to talk to more scientists or people that have ideas about um, developing this more. However, my research obviously still develops and I've been also thinking about something else. And that is um, the latent image. And that's something I'm trying to move on to kind of. Um, one issue that I found while visiting not just CERN, but also a lot of other scientific places uh, in Barcelona, such as the university or ICFO, or um, I, I got to a whole array of high and low energy experiments, uh, telescopes and um, microscopes. So I was in all the different types of making things visible. And every time I got introduced to such experiments, the scientists actually used very different words. And it was for me always this like moment of trying to run into understand what is their language and what word means actually what in the language the previous scientists from another entire different experiment actually used. So one thing that I uh, found is that there's two words that I um, have started to use is uh, the window and the messenger. And of course, that seems like maybe superficial or maybe not useful, but for me, it's a really easy way to make the, um, my conversation with the scientists that do uh, experiments of perception, I guess, um, to expand that. So what I'm looking now for, I guess, Maybe it's a really strange thing to do, but I'm, I'm wishing to kind of make a formula, a thesis, a theorem, I don't know what you would call it, to uh, calculate, but not calculate with numbers, but to make stacks of how to describe the latent image space. And the latent image space can be made out of possible and impossible. So that's where my um, research is now kind of at. I think that's where I will uh, stop this presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing all of that with us, Rosa. It was amazing. Um, I, I took I took quite a, quite some time looking at your website and was fascinated by a lot of things. Um, I want to well just like do a 180 degree turn and uh, head into well what the title of our conversation is, which might seem weird because it's uh, dimensions of embodiment. I've been thinking, how can we um, bring all together, bring together all of these uh, fascinating visions of not just art and science, but many other things, and well, perhaps think of embodiment of the body. I think um, hearing uh, both Paul's talk and uh, Rosa's and uh, Michael's. Um, Ideas. Uh, there's this idea of the black box that has kind of come up a few times, and which I think is is fascinating because, well, in theory, like a black box is something that should be impenetrable and should like not uh, not be modified. That that's my understanding when I when I hear the word black box, I think of like the, an airplane's black box. But I guess that applies to many different things, perchance even to the body at some point. Um, However, well, I, I think uh, thinking of what Paul shared with us in his talk, there is uh, no doubt that this uh, black box has slowly crumbled and revealed perhaps like a different resolution, a different granularity where, well, we're not closed, we're actually open, we're made of many different things, such as the bacteria that make us smell as a uh, also uh, fluently kind of puts there in front of us in his in his work i'd like to like yeah i'd like to know what you guys think about this this idea of the body as black box or not or how do you think this echoes in like political social and scientific and artistic senses um that would be my kind of question for you i don't know who wants to start We all have to think about this one for a second. <laughs> I think uh, one thing that I, so I, I don't know if I want to, this is such a complex question. There's like five parts of that that you could answer. And I don't think that any of us have like 
uh, a concise answer to that. But to me, if you're talking about, well, there's one, two things. I think it's always dangerous to compare the body to a machine. There are, there are like uh, certain problems with that, I think. So I'm always a little bit hesitant. Uh, at the same time, I know what you mean with a, a, a black box. And uh, I mean, black boxes are, it's just another word, word for like making things obscure or knowing there's something that you cannot see, right? So I'm just thinking like you're asking to me uh, if I'm, I'm allowed to make the question more simple. I'm, I'm thinking that you're asking what types of obscure are in our worlds, right? Well, there's many. So um, I think the most beautiful thing that we can do is learn um, that a lot of ways of seeing are built out of making the thing that we try to perceive fluid, the information fluid to get it to another way, to transform it to another way of showing it. That sounds maybe really weird, but what I'm trying to say is, as an example, if I take a photo with a digital camera, I get the light, I get that electricity on my CCD chip, that CCD chip translates that to digital data, and that data then later is compressed and recompressed into an image. There's a lot of layers of translation there. That is just an image, but you could do the same with everything. And that whole mode of translating that data, I could make a photo, and put some filters over it and it could start to sound like Beethoven, you know? And just to learn to think that things are actually more fluid than we've been taught to believe, I think is something really important. And so I think what we're really missing in our contemporary cultures is to play and learn and stay open to that fluidity that is now packed into these black boxes. That's, that's my answer. <laughs> Well, for, for me, for me, there is another aspect what, uh, what uh, Rosa just mentioned, uh, because she also said uh, in her video that she is colorblind for certain colors. It's it's also the perception of the body. What do you do? What how do you process information, and how, what do you do with the information? How do you process and what comes out behind the black box? When behind me there is a black box called CMS, and uh, this is also something where uh, we through this uh, black box, we uh, observe something which is absolute abstract. So, which which you uh, no, with normal linear uh, um, uh, construction of our um, experience, we cannot imagine. So, we 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 need to you we need to use a, a, a very abstract embodiment, if you like, to understand what's going on in this uh, in this universe in this microcosm of the of the small, smallest elements of the universe and then of course one should, should uh, we should never forget which is also very interesting is what we do here in with this experiment with this huge apparatus we do nothing else than also, also just explained with the light coming in so we get signals we process we uh, so a physical effect in our on our detectors, so on the eyes, then gets gets transported in our brain, and then we create something, and then again coming back to Rosa, not everybody sees the, and perceives the same thing, and this is also something what what, what we sh what we should also take into account that not just the physical information we we, we can uh, we uh, we receive, but also what we do with it and what consequences. How do we mix this information afterwards? What comes out of our us as a black box um, as, as as experience? Yeah. No, I it's, it's an interesting question, and I I, I like things we I, you guys have said. Uh, I, I also think there's like there's so many different. On the one hand, the black box, and and like the way that Rosa is kind of critiquing is is this idea of of like. An engineering diagram in which something that's too complicated gets kind of abstracted into just a little box. And on the other hand, there's almost like a cybernetic aspect of it, like where there's something that is so complicated that all we can really understand are the inputs and outputs, right? We don't even we don't even attempt to kind of try to understand the complexities. And so we kind of say that's beyond us or that's you know, that's some kind of infinite place we can't go. And that's kind of the more for a phenomenological level of it. 
right? That, that like we kind of admit that all we get to see are the kind of things which are available to our spectrum of vision or our kind of, uh, our, our, our mesoscopic kind of place in the world or something like that. And so that bodies as a black box as such are then like, I guess to say that like, you know, geez, we, it's, it's more complex than we can possibly, um, describe so we will leave it as a black box to us not kind of insult that complexity too much right or to too much reduce that to something too too simple we will focus on these inputs and outputs just because it's what we can do with a little bit more humility or something um and maybe in that aspect it's kind of an interesting way of looking at it comparing paul do you think that we are being trained mm -hmm. to to just accept black boxes like uh, that we've become blind to the actual obfuscation of the process? Um, I mean, th that was always the kind of idea of why black boxes were put into effect, right? So, on the one hand, to keep us from having to get into those nitty gritties and to be able to kind of like forget about what, what put us at this, right? Like how we got here in a sense. So I think that's part of, the purpose um, of, of these things. I, I mean, I, I, I tend to think that some of the kind of, I, I was first introduced to the idea of a black box through like by brain scientists saying that like, listen, the kind of mechanisms of the brain are just too complex. So, so, so we're not going to pretend that we understand the sort of quote unquote circuitry of the brain or something like that, but we can measure inputs and outputs. And that's kind of the idea of, of that there are certain things that can be measured certain attributes of things that, that there's a kind of honesty to that right that they that that we only have these certain kind of perceptual tools um and 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 so, so it's, again i i i kind of appreciate the humility of that i that think it's sense. interesting that you say i appreciate that and i think it's honest because i have actually kind of an opp oppositional feeling i'm starting to feel like i'm at war with the black box and that uh -huh. it's like, it's just such a violent object that it's, it's violent because we're not trained to reconsider its action. Like we are just not learning how to open it anymore. Right. We're just learning right. to um, accept it. I mean, again, this is very much the kind of Latourian perspective too, right? The black box can be something that can be sealed because on the one hand, it's been pushed beyond debate right uh but then it becomes very very difficult to reopen that again um so uh, I, I, that's again the kind of more the engine i guess i was trying to say that maybe there's two different variations on the black box this kind of engineering diagram that hides it also because even in contemporary computer software design many people don't the idea of like object oriented coding is to make these black boxes also so that not not everybody can recreate the software in its entirety so we can also be kind of compartmentalized i guess that's why i get this the kind of engineering problems of it as opposed to maybe the more kind of understanding of it as a kind of just an area that like humbly says you know we only have our phenomenological kind of understandings of what we're perceiving coming out of this thing and the interior part, we're, we're making sure we don't mm, we, we we don't try to show what we don't know. <laughs> that I, I, have, I have one I have one question to you as well, because um, we are we are this is a theoretical uh, philosophical discussion. However, it has a, a very uh, uh, direct impact in this in the society what we live or how we live now because um, these black boxes uh, if you if you if you take uh, technological objects like uh, this black box you get in something and then you, you you feed them out and then you post it on Instagram immediately and uh, so you transform uh, the reality and create new things um so what what does and we don't understand anymore so uh, uh we we let ourselves guide by what what kind of parameters so and what what do we communicate and what kind of impact does has this to the uh, the feedback loop to our society 
Well, but because more and more people present themselves through a black box they don't understand. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's yeah. What, what do you? Well, how do you see uh, these these wide um, uh, distribution, which is it always can good it's a good thing and a bad thing, but uh, because you are talking about okay, we accept that we don't understand. But how uh, can are we as scientists and artists allowed to say this? Mm. Mm. Well, if we say this already, the next the, the society who are uh, are not trained to think uh, make more steps in the thinking process. Yeah, so where yeah. Does it us? yeah. No, the, and again, I'm thinking out loud here. Uh, this is uh, off the cuff thinking. But I guess, I think of like, I think of like diagrams used in chaos theory. Like when we, when we see like, you know, um, uh, the evidence of, you know, these like a population graph in chaos theory, how first we see that it's linear and that there's a simple relationship that's linear between population growth and say time. Or something, but then then the, the 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 graph bifurcates, and we see that there's uh, alternation of year to year in terms of this growth, and there's no kind of average, right? The the I think of those graphs as being something that very much show the output of a black box, which is very complicated, right? On the one hand, they're just showing us one single measurable attribute of a system that is so kind of complex that um, it, it can't be treated as an average or, you know, I mean, I guess this is the, the dimension I'm getting at. Like there's something very useful about understanding that that one measurable aspect. Uh, but because the kind of population dynamics is something that is completely like the, uh, the most complicated kind of feedback systems kind of taking place that, um, yeah, some somehow like in those in those chaotic representations, in those you know the 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 way in which these kind of population dynamics are become so unpredictable in a sense uh, that I find those kind of graphs that again they they just they they only show us one thing, but they show us one thing which I think is kind of like paradigm altering. I mean, I, I am not, I, I agree with you that it's useful, but I would say we have become so lazy that we don't actually know, we, we don't see a black box when we touch it at all. Mm -hmm. Like you can say like your phone, etc. No, even the news, the Corona numbers, it's all black box. We don't actually, mm -hmm. like every country uses their own way of counting them that's already a black box and it's that's a social black box mm -hmm. so i would say like again i, I really want to stress that and i know it's an old trite um argument and you say it's a Turian. i would say there's a protocol from alex galloway there's many ways to like say okay there was theorists before that that said this but i would say again actually there's black boxes in most of the things we touch but i think the um, the real challenge that we're having now is to learn to see what different scales and scopes are being black boxed. So really just to sure. learn to reprod not just, you know, a machine, but the actual social reality we're canvassing, understanding like, hey, here's a mechanism at stake that makes that this crisis like so and so. If I would scale up or down, it mm -hmm. would say something completely else. Mm. Uh, as uh, Michael asks, are artists allowed? I would say humans, every person, part of society is not allowed. They need to learn to think like that again, because then we will get away with uh, this like fights about what is truth or what is not truth. No, we need to learn to find, come to terms. The black boxes have made it completely impossible for us to understand at what terms we're talking. What are the um, mechanics of describing the world, describing what numbers are interpreted so and so because we just have to accept every black box and i would say it's a almost um 
we as humans, not as artists, not as theorists, every human needs to learn again to reconsider the skills at which they're reading, writing, touching, and that those skills mm -hmm. mean something yeah. else from different levels. And that's something like, I would say it's like scaling theory. It's a scaling, it's a thought mechanism that we're not being taught. At least I know from the Western perspective, we're not being taught that. And I think that's where we really get into trouble. Yeah. I, I think I, I'd like to say that, um, yeah, I think I'm, we're, we're reaching a, a kind of a conclusion somehow, which is that I, I, can, I would interpret it as it's almost a question of design and design is a thing that happens in the present. And it relates to embodiment because we design for our bodies as a species kind of thing. So, I, I mean, I, I, I kind of wanted to do this question because as artists and scientists and, in, and thinkers and human beings, without a doubt, I think that is like perhaps a place where we can agree upon rethinking the paradigms with which we design black boxes. And in that sense, technology and science and uh, I, myself as, as an artist and in, in, in a way a, a designer, I, I, yeah, I think that that is something that personally attracts me a lot about science and talking with scientists and trying to fuse both things because as artists, we design and we have an intuition perhaps of how to design outside of the black box as it is, has been standardized so roughly and so paradoxically, impossibly to, you know what I mean, kind of it's become just too that's why we're in this crisis of truth. Just look at a presidential debate and you'll be like, oh my God, this is just, there is not an apex of truth because I think we need to redesign and start thinking in terms of design and creation and creativity as artists and scientists, how we can, yeah, configure new ways of thinking that allows us to re reconstruct these black boxes or something of sorts. Mm -hmm. I don't know. What do you guys think about that? That'd be my other question. Like, how can we redesign from a positive standpoint in a way? I, 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 I think you all have amazing questions. CERN is doing this. Rosa's work, I think, is doing this. And Paul's work is doing this, if I yeah. may say so. Yeah, no, it's an interesting question. Um, this is, I, I, and I, I don't, I, I don't disagree with any of these, uh, any of the kind of comments that others are firing either yet um I, I maybe another question i would pose to this is again i'm just kind of thinking out loud here is this whole uh, the, the notion of the whole as opposed to the parts right like how does this relate to this whole to, to the notion of um uh you know like we think about medicine right and we think about if we think about the black the body is something that we need to invade down to the kind of the, the sort of my most minute particular sometimes we forget about the kind of flows that kind of emanate from it um uh and and the sort of a holistic understanding of the body itself also and so i, I think there's also because you brought it up in the context of the body there's also this this whole notion of the kind of space between the kind of eastern and western um or the modern the modern body that kind of is you know uh the, the 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 more we we unlock it we unlock both its mysteries and its biopolitical potentials and we uh you know we we, we kind of further integrate it into kind of a, a whole machinic network so i'm maybe i'm just putting this question out there to you all too of what you think of this notion i think it relates very well to what simon says um i was gonna say um, when Simon said it's like a question of design, I was going to say, yes, we need to learn how these design principle, uh, principles are affecting uh, at what scales we're using or looking or uh, acting in the world. Um, uh, I lost my train of thought. Um, but the point is, um, I think we can... That's not just learning how to design. I think that's something we need to learn to consider at schools. And when you say, um, uh, Paul, um, it's a matter of the parts, I think we can, um, uh, the, so the parts or a whole, I think the way we can like tackle this type of problematics is by looking at the smallest parts and seeing what are the issues there. Because the whole, we will never know if we can see the whole. 
but the smallest parts we can break them apart or at least that we have access to that's where we start we start with like um rather not the biggest things but we start with like really understanding where the limits are so from limits we can start to learn and see skill but not from trying to be in immediately seeing the whole picture that that would be my idea there i hope i i formulated that that it made sense <laughs> <laughs> well, there's just there's just one one thing I want to comment to what you just explained. Uh, be careful, uh, because uh, even uh, in our thinking, um, the the very small, uh, as we know, um, is beca becomes a completely. Um, like Paul said, it, it, there's more chaos theory involved, because uh, it's not just a linear relation between these very small uh, elements so to complete um, to conclude from from the small parts to a, a more complex structure is, is pretty um, difficult so if you think about our brain uh, if, if you study how it how it uh, how it's built up and then make the link to the thoughts we have this is a tricky part you can you can cut it up and and uh, and, and uh, look smaller and smaller, but at the end, the, the black box, as our brain, process something, um, which is very difficult uh, uh, to to then to link it in in the in the linear uh, thinking process. It's uh, there you need um, artists and philosophers uh, to explain us scientists who cut it up in the very smallest part how this whole thing gets uh, gets a, a really as complex as a, a, as a big part because it's the small parts are not our thoughts so mm -hmm. and this is also the the link what uh, i understood from paul uh, it's 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 uh, it's it's a difficult uh, or not an an obvious connection between uh, understanding the small elements to what comes out of the small box, of the big box, as a soul, as a thought, of a feeling. So it's it's yeah. There's it's a very interesting. We, I think we should we should extend this discussion another three hours. <laughs> yes, I think. <laughs> so say we have five minutes left. It's <laughs> bad. <laughs> I I'd like to say that um, yeah. By I think this sign also would very strongly imply um, thinking about designing education as well, because I think this is, I try to frame this like in a propositive frame, frame to, to say it so. And I think, yeah, like design would very, I would very much like the question would be, how can we make th people think about these questions of black boxes in a, in a way that allows them to, yeah, kind of as, a, as, a, as individuals and as a whole, how are we going to like think this? And just becoming aware of it, I think would be like a very strong, I mean, for me, becoming aware of it is very like, whoa, wow, yeah, I hadn't thought about that, and that is very inspiring. Maybe, maybe let me make a, 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 a quick comment on education, because this is, for me, a very, very important uh, aspect. And uh, that's why I'm so happy uh, on our collaboration with So Atomica, uh, because this is something where we connect multidisciplines, okay? We, we create a dialogue, and then for me, the very important part, uh, which is uh, the, the question uh, to answer your question is, we need to um, to embed in education, especially for the next generation, and we should start at the, at the very small to make them aware how, that science is some a, a, a creative topic. And art is a serious negotiation and, and, and view on the topics. And we need, we need to cross over the disciplines and make them and train them to, to not just learn formulas for physics, but to look out and, and understand what's out there um, as concepts and also then link it in as consequences on our social behavior, climate change, uh, whatever. Mig migration uh, structures so it's 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 um it's not a, a one parameter you you can tune it's a multi-parameter and if you don't 
uh, if you don't train our our uh, in the in the education our education system to people think out of the box to allow themselves to add other parameters in their in their uh, equation, um, then we in the 21st century we will have a problem because this was in the 19th century and we are now in the 21st century. That means education means. We, uh, and this is an invitation to all the artists and all the scientists involved uh, to, to make their point to the next generation and, and, and tell them this is important to look outside as well and not just uh, uh, on their own uh, yeah, small world of, of the experience. Okay, I think we have maybe two minutes left, so if... Paul and Rose, I want to say some final closing remarks. Thank you very much for this really inspiring talk. I'm, I, well, okay, I'll, I'll go and then Rose, <laughs> if you want. Uh, I mean, I, I must say, I in thinking about the way that uh, I'm, I'm led back to the to the kind of the STS model of looking at the way in which facts are constructed as being pretty useful um, for now um, I, in terms of, I mean, uh, again, my, my, I've built a lot of my practice off a kind of criticism of a certain kind of um, um, reductivist modern science. Um, but at the same time, that's not to throw science out the window, right? That, that it's, it's more, for me, it's been about a way of tracing the way facts are constructed and to, to see that the construction of facts isn't necessarily a negative. Uh, it's just a, a fact, <laughs> right? That that that, that we, we 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 have all these systems of peer review and publication and things like this to begin to kind of construct an understanding of things, um, and that we can, if we understand that process, we can both kind of uh, we can continue the kind of to kind of overturn some of the simple oversimplifications of modern science, but at the same time, we can also um, refute some of the anti-science. Uh, kind of, uh, I guess, really this kind of disruptive propaganda that, that that's also happening. I, I think that for me has been the only kind of consistent tool set that kind of does both. Yeah, I I think all I can do is like maybe ask a question about it because I don't have the the actual answer. But I just for me the way to um, to help educate future generations, but also our peer generations to, to expand their way of thinking about these black boxes, which are also boxes, latent boxes of opportunities, if we could open them and do other things with them. So what I would then think is important or would require from the user is to learn to understand that these are stacked spaces, there are levels at which we can prod them. So we need to learn how to understand what affordances or learn to see how these stacks have different build out affordances. And for that, what we need is to always be honest and come back to an understandable language. So if you're designing your machine, if you're designing your program, if you're designing, I don't know what you're talking about, like whatever, politics, disease, the body. Come If you want to really open that knowledge up and educate, come back and come to a level that everybody can understand what the words are that you're using so you can have a level, a discussion at the same level. So yeah, that comes back to what Simon also said. It's like, okay, we need to redesign education, meaning that we need to understand that all these different sciences and all these different uh, people are using different languages, but we need to find a way to bridge between those languages again so we can all actually think together rather than that somebody or some scientist is the best at this language and the other is the best at that language because that's cool we can do language battles but it will not help us share the knowledge yeah hey thank you well thank you very much for this it's uh, very sad we have to stop i could continue chatting with you for many hours probably but uh well i think we yeah uh, we've had some really interesting thoughts uh thank you for sharing your work i think it's uh, a, a platform from which all of these conversations and all of these perhaps you know positive thoughts could emerge um i know personally for me 
they do without a doubt just seeing what you guys do makes me i don't know yeah feel hope for humanity again or whatever let's not be that that fatalistic and cliche but in a way yes <laughs> so well uh in in from from suratomica we really thank you for being here for sharing your time with us uh it's been an, an amazing privilege for me personally to sit here and chat with you and uh well uh, unfortunately we need to we need to give it space for the next talk and um I'll do some closing words in Spanish. Uh, and well, thank you. Um, gracias a todos por estar acá, los que nos están viendo por YouTube. Eh, esperamos que haya sido grata y productiva esta conversación. Y bueno, seguimos con la programación del primer festival Suratomic. Muchas gracias. Bye. Great bye talk. Bye. Well, really great seeing all the work. Guys. Gracias. <laughs> <laughs> Chao, gracias. A tu también.